objects in our experience have horizons. So what makes the horizon of the body so special, so unique, so important for phenomenology, according to Merleau-Ponty? Well, the body is the only thing whose appearance is double and that therefore resists being posited as an absolute object. So it makes some kind of sense to say, well, the things over in the next room are there and they're there independently of how they appear to me. But the body can never be there independently of how it appears to me. So for every explicit bodily representation, say I hold my hand up in front of my face and perceive it visually, it's doubled by an internal perception of how it feels from the inside to move that hand around. This was something that Husserl stressed, the doubling of the body. So the body is the only thing, I can't say, oh, my body's over in the next room, and there it is, independent of what's appearing to me. No, the body is, the, is always appearing to me, and it's through the body that the other things get posited as objects. So the body is the locus of phenomenological reflection for Merleau-Ponty. If it's through the body that the other things get posited as objects, and we want to have an understanding of how our sense of the world unfolds, then we need to understand primarily how our body accomplishes that, how our body appears to us. So to summarize everything that's just been said, a body schema is not an explicit representation of the body, like when I look in the mirror, for example, but rather a horizon or a set of possibilities. And the possibilities of the body are possibilities of movements. So the body schema is a set of possible movements that I grasp myself as being able to do without thinking about it at all. This generates a fundamental ambiguity of our being in the world. Since that we're in the world through our body, and since we're in the world through our bodily possibilities, well, possibilities don't need to be compatible with one another. It's possible, for example, that it'll rain tomorrow, but it's also possible that it won't rain tomorrow. There's no contradiction here, but in actuality, once the time comes, it'll either be raining or not. So there's a difference between possibility and actuality in this sense, in that non -im non-compatible possibilities can both subsist together. Now, since we're in the world through our possibilities, that means at a pre-theoretical level, the way the world appears to us is ambiguous. It's split between different interpretations, different possibilities. So the world initially appears to us as a subjective space of possibilities rather than a, a bunch of objects in the world. So we're not in the world as one object among others, but we're in the world as a space of possibility. This fundamental ambiguity is expressed in Merleau-Ponty's famous discussion of the phantom limb, which he carries out on pages uh, 82 and following in the Phenomenology of Perception. It really goes back uh, further, but uh, for our purposes, we, we begin our discussion of the phantom limb on page 82. So you'll notice he titles this section, uh, section D here on 82, the ambiguity of the phantom limb. And that's what we're referring to is this ambiguity of our being in the world that's illustrated by the possibility of phantom limbs. So phantom limbs are when we lose, someone loses a limb and yet still has feeling as though the limb is there. So if you were to amputate your arm, it would still feel as though there was an arm there. Now, Merleau-Ponty thinks the phantom limb shows an important confirmation of his view of this, of the body schema. So it shows in, in particular that our body schema is primarily a horizon. Even though the objective arm is gone, it's not a thing among other things, the pre-objective space of possibilities still recognizes the arm. And remember, uh, the pre-objective space of possibilities can sustain incompatible possibilities. So we have both the possibility of the arm's movement 
and the non-possibility coinciding in the schema, in the body schema of the phantom limb patient. So Merleau-Ponty on page 84 says, to have a phantom limb is to remain open to all of the actions of which the arm alone is capable and to stay within the practical field that one had prior to the mutilation. So again, he's playing on this idea that our, the way we're inserted into the world, our fundamental being in the world, is a being of a possibility space. So Merleau-Ponty draws a lot of philosophical lessons from this case of the phantom limb. He thinks that our very sense of there being an objective world out there, populated by things and objects and events and other people, depends on a pre-objective, ambiguous world of subjective perceptions. He says on page 84, this is the paradox of all being in the world. So my body schema structures the way objects appear. The milieu, he says, of my, my objective reality, the things that surround me, originates in my body schema. Why is that? Well, if my body schema is a set of possible movements, and the possible movements determine the relation of the things around me, right? The mug is right here because I can reach out and grab it. There's a possibility for me to use my body to reach out and grab it. Whereas the store on the other side of town is over there because I would need to enact a much more complex set of body movements. Now those are possible, but they reach further out into the horizon. They push the store, my body pushes the store away from me. It's over there, we're not right here. So the way the world appears to me is structured by my body schema. And it's only by coming to realize that these possibilities don't always line up with the actual world, that we come to have a sense of the actual world whatsoever. I can be wrong. I can, as a phantom limb patient, have the possibility of moving my arm, and that doesn't coincide with the objective possibility of moving my arm. Or I can think that the, it's possible for me to reach the coffee mug, and yet it's just out of arm's reach. And only by looking at the discrepancies between my pre-objective world of space of possibilities and the possibilities that I can actually enact, only in that way do we come to think of the world as something that's populated by objects. So it's because my body is a lived field of possibilities and not merely a permanent object that I can come to perceive a world of objects at all. My body is that by virtue of which there's objects. Rather than primarily being an object, it's the thing by virtue of which objects are constituted. Merleau-Ponty considers another very interesting abnormal case of bodily perception in examining the patient Schneider. He, so he was looking at medical records and he talks about the case of a patient who was unable to localize where a mosquito was stinging him and yet was able to scratch his leg when stung. So if doctors asked him to point to where the mosquito is stinging you, he'd be unable to do it, but he was able to just scratch his itch whenever the mos mosquito stung him. So there was something different when he tried to conceptualize his body um, in an abstract way, according to, as, as if his body was an object, a set of points, say a, a set of coordinate points, he couldn't point to the correct coordinate. So he couldn't conceive of his body in this abstract way. But when given a task, his bodily possibilities unfolded as normal. He was still able to scratch the itch. So in other words, our body schema is always working to coordinate itself with the objective space. And Schneider shows that there is this distinction between our bodily space of possibilities and the objective coordinate space because his had become disassociated. Schneider still had a grasp on his body as an I can, I can reach out and itch, but he didn't have a grasp on his body as an object. So this grasp on our body as an object is something that we're accomplishing 
on the basis of our pre-objective, ambiguous being in the world. So all of this is said to lend support to Merleau-Ponty's big idea, which is that the body constitutes consciousness and constitutes intentionality. So think about Husserl's conception of intentionality. Intentionality is what directs us onto the world. It's the relation between the mind and the world. So Merleau-Ponty says, these clarifications, all the ones we've just been discussing, allow us to understand motricity or the possibility of movement unequivocally as original intentionality or the thing that connects us to the world. So he says, consciousness is not originally an I think, but an I can through bodily movement. So how does consciousness end up referencing objects or how does it generate the arrow of intentionality? Through the body. But Merleau-Ponty warns us against thinking of our body as a kind of searchlight that highlights, say, casts a light or highlights objects that are already set out there in advance, ready made for the light to shine on. Rather, intentionality in the bodily sense projects our horizons that generates our being in the world. It ensures that we're situated within a physical, cultural, moral world, and that therefore gives us the sense of the world. 